hello student let's start the second portion of anterior chamber so we have finished in your last class up to the juxta canicular mesework so now we are going to start with the slims canal or canal of slims so let me show you the picture first this is the canal of slims is a round structure is a tube like structure which is covered the whole limbal area basically which is covered throughout the limbal area limbal area means what the junction between sclera and cornea so this area okay so listen what is this telling the slims canal is a circular lymphatic like vessels in the eye that collects the aquasima from the anterior chamber and deliver into the episcleral blood vessels by the aqua vein so this is a basically a simple canal this is the canal which is round uh, circular lymphatic line and this job is to collect the aquasima from the anterior chamber and drain into the episcleral blood vessels by the aqua vein the main job Slim's canal is often divided into the different parts by the bridges and septa. So this slim's canal is divided into different portions by bridges or septa. The septa cross the lumen of the canal mostly in an oblique direction. Septa or bridges, whatever that is, they divide or cross the this lumen. This lumen. obliquely basically they are often fixed to the outer wall of the canal and placed where the collector channels begin so they are basically outer side the present and where the collection takes place the across from the collector so that takes place they are present over there the structure of the outer wall of slim's canal differ very much from the inner wall so the structure of the outer wall and the inner wall is very much different so let's see what is that one because they say that this is a huge difference between the inner wall and the outer wall so this is the inner wall as you this is the inner wall and this is the outer wall 100% better okay oh. oh, here we can see the bigger form so this is a kind of slim you can see this is a kind of slim sc is written over there okay it's a clear picture okay so here this is if we see the under the left microscope see that the inner wall this is the inner wall and this is the outer outer wall is more compact compact to the inner wall so that's the difference in the anatomical structure and apart from this two things i i'd like to highlight over here if you see here Most of the aqueous vein drain the epithelial vein. This is the aqueous vein which collects aqueous vein from the scanner slim and drain to the epithelial veins. And second one, I'd like to show you the interstellar and deep scleral plexus. Interstellar, deep scleral plexus. These are the whole thing. Interstellar, deep scleral plexus. Now coming inner wall of the scanner slim, slim or slim scanner. So as I said, there is a different structure. This, if it is electron microscope, this look like this. The structure is look like this. So the endothelial lining of the canal consists of the complete monolayer of the flat endothelial cells, and that do not rest completely basement membrane. So flat endothelial cells are present over there. Uh, that's the first thing. Second is that subs. Endothelial cell layer is not complete and consists of elongated star-like cells oriented predominantly in a radial anteroposterior triangle. So another thing is that the star-like cells are present also with them, which is oriented anteroposterior directions. The lateral walls of the endothelial cells are joined directly tight junctions. So these cells are tightly junctions, tightly joined together. They do not have the loose connection. The outer wall of slim scan. That is the inner wall and outer wall. Outer wall little bit, and not little bit more tight junction. If you see here, the vacuole space are there. So in the inner outer wall, you can see 
there is no tide, there is no vacuum space. So literally gaps are there, definitely that should be there because can also solely uh, take the fluid and uh, drain into the physical hands. So that is that should be there. But it's not that too uh, loose tide. The endothelial lining is single layer and with a well-developed basement. There the basement membrane was a problem. But here is a well-developed basement membrane is present over here. Well-developed basement is present. And the cells do not process the transcellular micro channels. That's another thing over here. They do not have transcellular between the cells. They do not have any micro channels. The adjacent stroma consists of collagen and elastic like fibers intermingled with the fibroblast. Adjacent stroma, which is present over there, they have the collagen and elastic like fiber mingled together in the fibroblast. Or the what is another name? Keratocytes. Collection channel or collector channels. So as I said just now that uh, they are collecting the from the canal synapse is basically collecting the aqueous human and the throat to the from the aqueous vein to the go to the epistolar vein. So see this is the canal lens, this is the aqueous human, you can follow the direction, this is the Production takes place in the ciliary body and then go to the here. That is the first. This is a structure. What is that? Tabiclomesma. Then canal slime. Canal slime to the this is uh, aqueous vein. Aqueous vein to what? Yes, they rose to epistolar vein. Then. So that's the other, other way we have also. So there are two directions actually indirect one and direct one. So you read both of them. So this is a direct one, indirect one also. So, the water. so the sense then is constant. Connected to the epistolar and conjunctival vein by a complex system called intraspiral channel. So, this is the intraspiral channel, which one? That the intraspiral plexus, you know? this is. So, so this is the called intraspiral channel. So, this is a complex system by the epistolar vein and conjunctival vein. Complex system. So, both are present over there. So, this is the both are present and, and called. So, two systems are intercanular channels that have been identified one indirect system and direct system. Let's see what is indirect system and one direct system. Indirect system, a consists of 15 to 20 inner fill, uh, three finer channels which form an interstellar plexus before eventually draining into the vascular venous system. So, as I said that here they have around 15 to 20 fine filaments which Collecting that before they are meeting over in the epistolar, going to the epistolar before that. So there is that. Or you can see here. Sorry, this is not epistolar. This is the plexus, interstellar plexus. In direct system, what happens? In the direct system, consists of large caliber vessels which run short interstellar pores and drain directly into the viscous vein system. They are about 6 to 8 in number and also called aqueous vein. So that is through the interstellar vein, uh, interstellar venous plexus, that is indirect one. Uh, this is indirect one, the number 15 to 20, and then directly to the viscous vein. And another one is, the direct one is that they are very clear. Cut. So they collect from here, and the same directly through the aqueous vein and epistolar go directly. So that is the direct one. So aqueous vessels terminates into the epistolar vein. So they mingle the here over there. So they end over there. Epistolar vein. Thus aqueous vessels terminate the, and, and conjunctival veins are laminated. And the junction is called the laminated veins or gold vein. So here they go and mix over there. So they call laminated vessels or gold vein. Vessel. Epistolar and conjunctival veins the most aqueous vessels are direct posteriorly with the most of the draining into the visceral vein. Where is that? Few cross the subconjunctival tissue and drain into the conjunctival. So, but it's a rare case. So, most of the cases you have to remember that most of the aqueous drainage system or aqueous humor draining system are, takes place through the episcopal vein. Very rare case, so rare to rare case, is subconjunctival tissue draining into the conjunctival vein. So mostly they are there, nearly over there. Okay. 
the epistolar veins drain into the cavernous sinus via the anterior ciliary and superciliary ophthalmic sorry superior ophthalmic vein. So once they get it, so the from the epistolar vein, they directly comes to the cavernous sinuses. So from a the anterior ciliary arteries and superior ophthalmic vein. This is superior ophthalmic vein and anterior ciliary arteries. This is anterior ciliary arteries. While the conjunctival veins drain into the superior ophthalmic vein, facial veins, and via the palpebral vein and anterior veins. So another one that conjunctival veins they also drain into the superior ophthalmic vein or facial vein. So they also go to the superior ophthalmic vein or facial vein. Through the which one the palpebral angular veins to the palpebral or angular veins from there it comes through the to the epistolar oh, sorry superior thumb vein they come sorry on to scleral spa uh, we have talked so much about this one because uh, that's the uh, another portion. Actually, this is vascular spa. Now we can see over here. This is a this is the look like this is you can see scleral spa just below the canal of slings. This is a canal of slings below the scleral spa. With the paid circular reach, plate translucent narrow strip of scleral tissue, and scleral spa is composed of a group of fibers known as scleral roll. So, this is the form of the scleral fibers of scleral roll. And scale is composed of 70 to 80 fibrous collagen and fibrous collagen. So, nothing but is a fibrous layer. Anteriorly really tabicular mesh, definitely this ridge or scale from anteriorly tabicular mesh, this is, and uh, posteriorly sclera fiber and sclera muscles. And if you see posteriorly sclera, definitely, and sclera. This is Contraction of longitudinal ciliary muscles opens up for the tabular stress. So here, what's happening over there? So there's a contraction of the longitudinal muscle ciliary muscles, which is present over here. Uh, they have three types of muscle we did during the uh, iris uh, in ciliary body, the uvia section. So longitudinal fibers, radial muscles, and circular fibers. So three types of muscles. Here, there's a contraction of the longitudinal ciliary muscles open up the tabular stress. So when these muscles are contracted, this longitudinal uh, fibrous or ciliary muscles contracted, then the tabicular mesh is open up. The scleral pass prevents the ciliary muscles from causing the canal of ciliary collapse. So, when you're contracting, the canal of ciliary should not collapse. So, they hold that way. The, the main functions to hold the canal of ciliary not to collapse. Individual scleral spar cells are innervated by the animal interactions and they have some innervation because any muscles and any actions takes place through the muscle cells. So, which the, all the muscles, sorry, all the non nerve supply is unmyelinated. So, what's nerve supply that over there? They drive from the superciliary nerve plexus and the ciliary plexus in the region of the scleral spar. So they have superciliary nerve plexus and all those are they have ciliary nerve plexus. Both sympathetic, adrenergic, and parasympathetic and sensory innervation also present over there. Yeah. So all three types of nerves are present there. So the first the types of nerves they are uh, present in the uh, uh, anterior chamber. So you can see that they have uh, superciliary nerve plexus, ciliary plexus, and as well as the sympathetic, adrenergic, and parasympathetic. That's very nice. okay. So now we contain the mechanoreceptor which are located in the scleral spa. So that's what they're acting actually when they're uh, contracting that uh, uh, longitudinal muscle fiber, ciliary muscle fiber, they prevent the collapse of scleral uh, scale. So how does that now we something that act as a group? So they are acting, uh, they act as a proprioceptive tendon organs of the ciliary muscles, contraction, myofibrillus, scale sparses, and bororeceptors functions in the response to change in the IOP. So three functions basically they have in the ciliary spar. First, they act on the ciliary muscles, 
dependent, they should act for the second contraction and appendix in this local cell. And say third one is the should act on the changes in the IOP. So, what are the importance of the angle of entry chamber? So we have read the whole thing of the angle of entry chamber. But what is the importance of first and foremost, that is a classification of glaucoma. Glaucoma is one of the site threatening disease due to the changes in the intercular pressure. So that can be uh, they have different stages, so we can wait on those sort of that's all. The angle of entry chamber is very important. Second, to know the extent of new vascularization. That is also can be noted. The axis of angular decision is there a change in the angle? We can check it. History of it or evidence of inflammation that also can be checked over there. For evidence of neoplastic activity, any changes over there. Degenerative developmental anomaly for planning or treatment, iris neovascularization or lesion procedure. So, that purpose is very important. So what are the diagnostic tests are there to check the angle of entry chamber? We have panoramic test, flash light or paint or test, ultrasound biomicroscopy, optical coherence tomography, obesity, and gonioscopy. So these are the common uh, techniques to test the angle of entry chamber. But we talked later this one when we go to the instrument side. Thank you.